grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller. I serve as pastor of St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, Illinois, St. Luke's Covington, and at Trinity St. John Lutheran School, Nashville, Illinois. Thank you so much for tuning into our Bible class. As an opening prayer today, let's listen to and pray with the 5th and 6th graders from Trinity St. John Lutheran School as they sing, Blessed Jesus, at your word, we are gathered all to hear you. Let our hearts and souls be stirred now to seek and love and fear you. Here's the entire hymn. Last week, we heard Jesus' prediction of his suffering, crucifixion, and resurrection. It was the third time Matthew records a prediction of Jesus before he gets to Jerusalem. And that was followed by Jesus' teaching after the mother of James and John asked that each of her sons be seated, one on Jesus' left and one on his right, in his kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Indeed, the time for Jesus' sacrifice is drawing closer. Before he gets to Jerusalem, though, there's one more healing, Matthew twenty twenty-nine to 34 and as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. 
And Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Now we know that Jesus healed many, many blind people in his earthly ministry. And scholars tell us that blindness was very common in those days, especially because of disease of one form or another. Those who were born blind, like the man that Jesus healed in John chapter 9, they were quite rare. We can hardly imagine the sicknesses that come upon people who have to live in unsanitary conditions. And imagine life without any antibiotics and other medications that we have today. How many infections that could lead to blindness were suffered by people. Today we can treat them, but there was nothing for them to do but suffer with it and then sit by the road and beg. I mentioned how common this is because Luke mentions a very similar event about the same time, but according to Luke, it happened already when Jesus was entering Jericho instead of leaving it, Luke 18. It's reasonable to me that there was more than one incident of Jesus restoring sight to a blind beggar. Now consider how many times blindness has already been mentioned in Matthew. In chapter 9, we came across two other blind men along the road up north whose vision was restored. They also cried out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When Jesus asked if they believed that Jesus could do this, they answered, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. In chapter 12, there was a demon-possessed man who was both blind and mute. Jesus healed him so that he both spoke and saw. In chapter 15, we have a wonderful summary of Jesus' healing ministry. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. And perhaps we learn the most about blindness in Matthew 11. Remember, that was the time when the disciples of John the Baptist, who was in prison, when they were sent from John and asked Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, Luke's account adds this detail, that in that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. Luke 7. Jesus answers, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Matthew 11. And that mention of the blind is quoted from Isaiah 35. There it gives a checklist of the evidences, the works to reverse the curse that the Messiah will bring about when he would come. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. You see, when God created the world, he looked at all he had made, and it was not only good, it was very good. There was surely nothing like blindness that God made and intended for his wonderful creation. It was only after the fall into sin and the curse of death that brought blindness, the same curse that has brought every condition of sickness, weakness, the loss or injury or any of any body part or system. Of course, this doesn't mean that people with these conditions have committed some sin worse than others. The book of Job and Jesus' teaching in John 9 make that very clear. Remember when God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, Moses was complaining that he could not speak very well. There was something deficient about the way he talked. God affirms as his workmanship every human being, no matter what, their limitations. He said, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? 
Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Exodus 4. No matter if we consider our bodies whole or as damaged goods, the Lord acknowledges that we are his workmanship and that he has made us for his own purposes. It is as though he has put his name on us, the way the great masters would sign their name to a work of art. And we know that the God who gave up his son for us has nothing in mind for us other than good and kind purposes. So back to the disciples of John, Jesus was telling them that blindness is part of the curse of sin and guilt. And he, Jesus, the Messiah, came to reverse that curse along with all the others. He, the creator, became a human being in order to remove the source of the curse on all creation. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung upon a tree. And when he comes back the second time and recreates the heavens and the earth, when we are raised to be like him, then there will be no more anguish from any of these conditions, just as we should expect the deserts and bleak parts of the earth to become like the Garden of Eden, lush and green. Like the blind man in chapter 9, like the woman in chapter 15 with the, who had a demon-possessed daughter, like the man in chapter 17, whose demon-possessed son was convulsed into life-threatening seizures, these two men here cry out, Have mercy! Lord, have mercy on us, son of David! More than once, it must have been a saying that many used. They had needs, they had great needs, and they cried out to their king to help them, the only one who could give them such help. The Greek word for Lord is Kyrie, and I mention that because it is a word that it's made its way into the liturgy of the church. In fact, the word for have mercy is eleison. Sometimes we even see that in a couple of our hymns. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. When we sing or say those words, we ought to think about our specific needs, however small or great they might be that day. We think of the people we love who need healing, those close to death, those who have suffered loss, those who are suffering in one way or another, all because of the misery that sin has brought into this world. More powerful and more gracious than even David, the great king of ancient Israel, is Jesus, the son of David and David's Lord. But the first answer these men hear, these two blind men, is not from Jesus, but words from the crowd. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. Many voices told them to shut up. We can only imagine the harsh words that they used. Jesus doesn't have time for you. Jesus can't help you. You got what you deserve. We know that's a lie. Now live with it. Well, there are multitudes of voices that try to convince us not to go to Jesus for help. If we suffer from some ongoing disability or chronic medical condition, there may even today be some who say, well, this is God's punishment because of sins that you did, or you must have done something very bad to deserve this. These voices and others like them, even those that come from well-meaning people, are not the voices of the Savior, but rather they echo the words of the great liar and deceiver, Satan himself. Remember the attitude of the people when Jesus encountered a man blind from birth, the disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. John 9. When we cry out to the Lord for help, many voices are saying, Be quiet. Even our conscience might say, Who are you to come before God to ask for help? You've tried and tried to overcome sin in your life. You're not fit for the Lord. Others, full of scientific knowledge that doesn't want to believe anything it cannot see, cry out, he can't hear you. He's just a figment of your imagination. If you're going to get help, you've got to help yourself. But no, these blind men kept calling out to the Lord. The more they tried to shut them up, the louder they called. So with us, in the face of the devil, the accuser, we keep coming to God with our needs. The more the voices of our conscience in the world try to stop us, the more earnestly we come before the Lord and beg for mercy. 
And the Lord is glad to receive us, isn't he? It says, in stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Just like Jesus scolded the disciples when they didn't want the little children brought to him, so Jesus speaks above the scolding voices and calls the blind man to himself. Notice how Jesus treats them with dignity and respect. He does not simply welcome them to come, but he also asks them, what do you want me to do for you? That might seem like an obvious question to us, but blind people have other needs, just as sighted people do. Who's to say there was not something more pressing on their minds that day than their desire to see again? Remember that paralyzed man they lowered through the roof to see Jesus. The first thing Jesus did was to forgive his sins. Then he strengthened his body so that he could walk. Well, speaking of the healing words and deeds of Jesus reminds us of the new creation that Jesus begins in us in holy baptism. It's called a washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, Titus 3. On Friday, when I was subbing for the 7th and 8th graders at Trinity St. John Lutheran School, they also wanted to record a song for you. Here's a song about the blessings of baptism, God's Own Child, I Gladly Say It, used by permission of the translator, Pastor Robert Velker. God's own child, I gladly say it. At St. John's New Minden, we've been blessed for over 26 years with a Braille ministry center in our schoolhouse. In little old New Minden, something like 40 different volunteers come together 
on a regular schedule from several different churches to manufacture, assemble, and mail books of the Bible in Braille. The book of Deuteronomy is one volume we produce. The other is a volume that contains the books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. Throughout the year 2023, 852 volumes were shipped out from here to 36 different countries. Pastor Dave Andrus, a pastor from St. Louis, who originally got us involved in doing this, and Pastor Andrus went blind when he was in middle school. He loves the way Jesus deals with these blind men with such respect, asking them what they would like Jesus to do for them. He goes on and explains more. He says, when it comes to blindness, very few people actually need constant care or help. In fact, if you do too much for a person who is blind, independent, and has adjusted to his or her new world, you actually may offend him or her. Instead, think about this simple guide. Sale, S-A-L-E. S is for stop. Stop before you do what you think a person needs. A is for ask. Ask as Jesus did. What may I do for you? L is for listen. The answer may surprise you as you catch yourself before you move into action. Really listen to what he or she says. And E is for evaluate. When you are told that no help is needed, it is okay to watch from a distance. If you feel that you should step back in to assist, speak what you see and again ask what you might do. Good advice. Well, in answer to their request that they would like to see, it says, And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Oh, a couple of wonderful words there. First, touch. Remember the touch of Jesus. In chapter 8, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched the leper, somebody no one would touch. And Jesus said, Be clean. When Peter's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever, he touched her hand, and the fever left her, Matthew 8. He let the woman with the twelve-year flow of blood touch the fringe of his garment, and he said to her, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well, Matthew 9. Many others were also healed by touching the fringe of his garment, Matthew 14. Matthew 17, when he showed his glory to Peter and James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were so scared that they fell on their faces. He touched them and said, Rise and have no fear. And my favorite, Matthew 19, they bring the little children to Jesus. Let the little children come to me, he said, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them. Jesus makes a way for his power and blessing and help to come to us as well. He touches our lips with his very body and blood, hidden under bread and wine in the supper for the forgiveness of our sins. Our bodies are washed with pure water in the sacrament of holy baptism. That is water empowered by the word of God to wash clean our soiled conscience. The words of the gospel and his forgiveness, precious words of Jesus, hit our eardrum. They are voiced by fellow sinners, but the Holy Spirit uses them to bear witness with our spirit that this Savior is for me, that I am indeed a child of God. And then there's the word pity or compassion that Jesus felt for these men. The word is from the word for guts or intestines. From the bottom of his heart, Jesus felt for them. It was a gut feeling, visceral love and care and concern. We read of this same thing in chapter 9. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then we read of him sending out the twelve. In chapter 14 it says, When he went ashore he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and healed their sick. 
and that was the crowd of 5,000 plus that he fed. In chapter 15, then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. That's when he fed the 4,000. And remember his parable in chapter 18 about the king who had compassion on the servant who had run up the huge debt of 10,000 talents. He had compassion on him, released him, and forgave him the debt. Well, in this week of Thanksgiving, we praise and thank God for his compassionate care for us how God loves us from the bottom of his heart. He provides us with daily bread and then some. He's canceled the debt of our sin. He has an eternal home waiting for us. Well, in closing, notice how these blind men called Jesus not only Lord, but also Son of David. They believed that this Jesus, though born a thousand years after the great king of Israel, was the new king. They believe the ancient promises to David that he would eternally have a son sitting on the throne over God's people, and they believed that Jesus was that king. In the section for next week, we will read that Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey's colt as he was welcomed by the crowds, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Matthew 21. Jesus was a king unlike any other. His crown was a crown of thorns, and his throne was a cross. Having completed his holy life for us, in his own body he bore the sins of the whole world, the sins of sighted people, the sins of blind people, the sins of all people. He suffered the excruciating separation from his own father for us. And now risen from the dead, today we continue to follow him. And may God bless our study as we turn to the last eight chapters of Matthew, the climax of Christ's work and his love for us. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by the children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, Illinois. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we continue our study of Matthew. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's where the gifts of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are offered every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We also invite you to our Thanksgiving Day services this Thursday, November 28th, 8.30 a.m. at St. Luke's Covington and 10 a.m. at St. John's New Minden. We thank Wilford and Mary Ann Frederking who have sponsored the broadcasts this month to the glory of God in memory of Dolores Frederking, who went home to Jesus on July 12th. If you would like to sponsor the Bible study for one or more Sundays, just let us know. There are many openings in the new year. We also thank our wonderful partners at V1047 and thank you for listening.